Good morning. Wonderful to, uh, to be together to do part two of, of the series. Um, I'd like to add my uh, condolences to uh, Cynthia and, uh, and John's children. Uh, John, um, in fact, I think it's nearly 40 years he's been with us because one of the most precious things that I own are videos of my children and uh, from when they were born all the way through. And in that era, you didn't have the iPhones to just do it. And so it was John Springer that would come with his cameras and uh, do my, my babies. And so one of the things that, and we've just run them off for all of our kids and family. E each one has now uh, all the videos from when Steph was a little baby to uh, when Catherine was born, right through when they were, I think when Nikki uh, went to Sydney because of her violin at 16, 17 years of age. So I'm just so grateful that John would come and spend two hours every, every few days. That's just one of the things that John did. And um, the other thing you, you may not realise, but, but John also financed uh, Cynthia to go and train the Papua New Guinea uh, children's workers. They went for years at their own cost into Papua New Guinea and Cynthia, one of her key ministries has been in children's ministry. She ran our kids' work and been involved in, uh, for our denomination as well. And so every year they would go. And there are pastors and leaders now in Papua New Guinea who came to Christ through Cynthia and John. And though John was holding her bags and paying the bills, she actually did that. Um, so uh, amazing contribution. And um, it's a mercy that John's gone to be with the Lord, really. And um, with uh, Alzheimer's, uh, it's a wicked disease. Uh, just when I saw him, just before I had my surgery two months ago, uh, he didn't recognise me at all. And uh, normally he would, and then, you know, forget what he said five minutes ago, but he didn't recognise me at all. And, and I could tell Cynthia was really, uh, was at the, at the point where the disease was going to take his life. But as Cass said, he has passed on into God's beautiful heaven. Uh, where there's uh, great joy and, and, um, and peace and freedom. So, uh, yeah, so condolence. So if you can be here on Thursday to those of you that know uh, Cynthia and, and John, uh, that, would be, that would be wonderful. Um, I am so thrilled we've got lights. Yeah. <laughs> I can see Lars. Lars, is that you? I can recognise you before I was in darkness. And so for years we had, uh, but you know, uh, Michael Bonacurso just said to me, Billy goes, these are LED lights, one tenth of the cost of power. So you imagine what these, these lights used to chew up. So we have um, uh, solar panels and our cost of electricity have dropped from 50,000 to I think under 20,000. And we're aiming to become... Uh, um, neutral in the next few years and so uh, so Michael and your team thank you for what you've done so that's the first part the first part of of um, your stewardship giving for the year it's been fantastic and then uh, Milan and team are going to be looking at redoing this area here regarding technology which we're again pretty behind in and then we're looking at PAs and stuff like that hey this week uh, it was a fantastic week, actually, being back at work after two months. Uh, I did all four services last weekend, and then Monday I had the senior leadership team of the church all day Monday, except Monday night, Tuesday, and then we had the CFC lead pastors Tuesday afternoon, board meeting Tuesday night, and then Wednesday, and that was great, and my energy levels have been good, been great, and then Wednesday was the best part of even those meetings. I went to meet my latest grandchild for the first time. Kathy had been there. So uh, Billy Day Hawkins, have a look at this little darling. Hey, forget that ugly old man, but look at that beautiful baby. And uh, there she is. And uh, you got the third one there? Oh, look at that. She's a little doll. And so um, we're just thrilled. She's, uh, she was two weeks uh, early. So she's just on 40 weeks there. So we're really thrilled. Uh, Catherine, uh, my youngest, who's 
turns 34 this year and if, in a couple of weeks and she's just delighted. She's like a, like a duck to water. She loves mothering. Isn't that great? So uh, really thrilled. And Josh is a magnificent son-in-law. I'm just thankful to God that I've got uh, three magnificent son-in-laws. I couldn't, uh, you know, when, I, when these kids were born, um, man, I just pray, I dedicated them right from the beginning. I said, Lord, the right man for this girl. And of course, those men had the fear of God upon them when they came to see me, first of all. And uh, so uh, I'm really thrilled and uh, delighted. So uh, it's great, wonderful to, uh, uh, to be a granddad and just to spend... Uh, Kathy came with me and uh, so we fought over the baby. I held her most of the time, and, uh, which, is, which is fantastic. So uh, we're thrilled. Um, last Sunday I shared on the beginning of the series, Made in His Image. And if you weren't here last week, you can get it on YouTube, on our, on our own CFC uh, channel. Um, and it also gives the details. I share a little bit about my journey in relation to where I've been the last couple of months battling uh, uh, ill health. And, um, and also there's a letter that I wrote last week that people can have if you weren't here last Sunday. It gives you a little bit of the background. And so I'm feeling great. Uh, I'm watching my energy levels. My kids are onto me. They want to know what my program is, what I'm doing. So I'm hiding it from them. I'm not telling them anything. Uh, but I'm not travelling probably through to next August. Uh, so it means a year off from travelling and uh, uh, overseas. Uh, possibly May. It just depends on what the, the medical specialists uh, say uh, later than the year, early next year. But um, I feel good. Uh, made for community is the theme today. Made in his image. We are uniquely made. Uh, we reflect the image of God. We, we reflect him in a way that the animal world uh, doesn't. We're the pinnacle of his creation. But we're made for community. We're not made to be isolated. We're not made to be on our own. We're meant to be with people. And uh, you can't fully uh, find yourself and, and know your full identity and experience your new identity in Christ uh, without being in relation with other people of like-minded faith who also are in Christ. And so I'm part of something bigger than myself. And, uh, you know, I finished uh, last week with the following verse uh, in Ephesians 2.10, and I want to uh, repeat it again um, and uh, have a look at it. He says, for we are God's handiwork. In fact, we are God's work of art. We're his work of art. We are his Da Vinci. We are his Raphael. Not Picasso, but you know, the, we are his, <laughs> the real painting, you know, like not cubism and, and all that weird stuff, but I mean, we are, for those who are artists and who love Picasso, my apologies, um, but we are his work of art, we're his masterpiece. And uh, we are God's handiwork and we're created in Christ Jesus. So he saved you. He, he, he's brought forgiveness into your life. And I just love the way Cass led us today. And that song that we sang, uh, it makes me weep when I, when I said the, the last song you had because that was one of the key songs that I was listening to and being ministered to by the Lord when I was in my dark space just uh, several weeks ago. And so uh, um, we, we are made in his image. We are his workmanship. We are his work of art. And uh, we're created in Christ Jesus to do good works. He has saved us. He has forgiven us our sins. He has, we're born from above. The risen Christ, amazing as it is, the risen Christ through his spirit now comes to live within us. I have him living in my body. Can you, oh, that's weird. Yeah. He doesn't want to live in a tent anymore or a building. He wants to live in my body because the sin issue's been dealt with. God looks at us now and, and we're guiltless and we're to be fearless and guiltless because our security is in him. We now are saved from our sins. We are saved from ourselves and we have eternal security and uh, we have eternal life and fullness of life now and, and life eternal when our time comes to be with the Lord in person. 
And so we're created in Christ Jesus. So he died on a cross to rescue you, to introduce you to the Father, to have this gift of eternal life and forgiveness. But more than that, but to do good works. And these good works are to be done here and now. And last week I focused about these good works being out there in the community. And the little phrase that, I, that I've coined a few years ago, that good works, our good works, create goodwill in people's hearts and minds so that God's good news can be received. And so the greatest evangelistic tool that we have as, as a church are the good works that we do out of a right motive. Acts of kindness, acts of generosity, acts of, of thinking through how we can help and add value to another person's life. Kindness, a smile, a handshake, an act of generosity. And uh, goodwill builds bridges of faith and, 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 and understanding and relationship. And because and, it's so foreign to how our world operates at times, which is so self-centered. So your good works that God has prepared in advance for you to do create goodwill in people's hearts and minds. And we pray that God's good news, that they'll be ready to receive. The reason why we do those things is because we're changed people. And it says here, which God prepared in advance for us to do. It reveals that God has sovereignly planned this, this for us and that he has a unique purpose for us to fulfill way before we were even conceived. Amazing. So now I want to focus on community, made for community. I am part of something bigger than myself. And I want to look at a couple of verses, particularly passages, one from the Apostle Paul and one from uh, the Apostle Peter. And uh, I want you to read these with me. They're fantastic. Romans 12 says this, a little bit of echo here, I, I'm, I, I'm, I can't hear myself properly, thanks Ryan. And um, Romans 12, 3 to 8 says, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, and don't think of yourself more lowly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, really sound rationality, Get a good handle on who you are according to the, with the faith God has distributed to each of you. In other words, see yourself now as he sees you in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body, he now he uses the body image of the church, with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we though many form one body and each member belongs to all the others. That's amazing. Each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Here he lists seven of the gifts of, uh, that, he, that he imparts. And so in this passage, it's an amazing passage. Let me just draw several dot points. Firstly, he's saying to us, practice humility. Please practice humility. We can put those dot points up, guys. Please, please, he's saying, practice humility. We must not have a self-righteous superiority or a self-demeaning inferiority complex. Both are wrong. Both are sinful. It is God who has given each of us a measure of faith to be able to serve him and to fulfill a ministry role in his church. It is by faith that you're saved. It is by faith that you serve. You can do nothing to save yourself. And even in our service of him, it's not that all of a sudden now I'm saved, therefore I've got to pay God back, roll up my sleeve. What can I do now to, to, to somehow pay God back? I owe him something. No, he says even your service, the gifts that he's given to you to be able to do good works, they come from him. Amen. Each of you have a measure of faith and each of us are different. And so... Uh, we have a unique ministry role in his church. Secondly, acknowledge the uniqueness of Jesus' church. Paul uses the imagery of a human body 
to illustrate the nature and functionality of his church. In other words, there's unity, one body. Look at your own body. It's, it's a unity. And yet there are many parts. Unity and diversity. One body, many parts. He says that these members do not have all the same function. And if you read 1 Corinthians 12 where he talks about the body, he says, hey, the eye is not the ear and the hand is not the foot. It, it, every part of your body is absolutely important. For it to be functioning healthily, every part needs to do its work. And he's actually saying the church to be healthy. A church to be healthy and to be growing effectively and to be fruitful requires that every part do its unique role for the unity, longevity and health of that local body. So appreciate our interconnectedness. We are better and bigger together than on your own. You're bigger and better by being in connection with people. Your full potential cannot be realised just on your own. You need people around you. And that's why God has his church. And for those who, who struggle with family and who perhaps are not connected well because of dysfunctionality in your family of origin and there's issues and, and there's terrible loneliness in our world. And uh, some of the loneliest people I've met actually are also married people. Incredible loneliness where there's just unhappy and it just hasn't worked for them. Or there may be a parent that they're just disconnected with or siblings and, and they're isolated. Well, we have a spiritual family that can fill the gap. And everyone needs a family. Everyone needs connection. I'm so thankful I'm connected to my natural family, but I'm also connected to my spiritual family. And in some respects, I'm more connected and closer to some of my spiritual brothers and sisters than to my natural family because of similarity of faith and values. And, and though I love my family and my extended family, you know, some of the values are different to our values. And so there's something unique about being part of the body. Appreciate our interconnectedness. Every part of the body needs to work harmoniously together for a church to grow in a healthy and fruitful way. And then discover the ministry gifts Jesus has graced you with. Paul lists seven of them here. Did you notice what they were? If your gift is prophesying, go back to that scripture, guys. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give, give encouragement. If it's to give, give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. These are seven. Do you know there are something like 15 of these gifts? And I have listed these in the church we can be, the book that I wrote. In fact, I said to Kathy when I was looking at it last night, I said, sweetheart, this is probably the best of the three books I've written. I said, it's not probably the easiest read, but it's actually the most important in many respects. And in it, there's very few books that I know that actually list the gifts, the 16 gifts, and then try and define them. Because the scripture says, you know, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, leader, encourager, administrator, mercy helper. But it doesn't define it. So what I tried to do was to say, well, look, in my 48 years of being, serving the Lord, where have I seen these gifts operate in people? And the multiplicity and diversity. I mean, you know, we joke about Pastor Phil Bryce. He's a wonderful pastor, but he's actually a prophetic pastor. I don't think there's ever been a service where I haven't seen Philip praying for somebody, prophesying over somebody. It could be here, it could be in the kitchen, it could be at the door. It's like he's a, prophet, a prophetic machine. Yes. It just flows out of him. He just has words of encouragement. Words that will, you know, we need encouragement. Prophecy is to encourage people. In other words, to fire them up. Or prophecy is for strengthening or edification. Yes. And, and that's to build people up. Or it's, it's for comfort and consolation to hold people up and we all need to be fired up held up and built up is there anyone here that's got it all together at any given time you need to be built up or fired up you know you might be just lacking and you know kind of bit discouraged you need encouragement or you're a little bit weak in yourself and you need to be built up or you need consolation and I'm sure Cynthia's family need consolation, comfort at this time, need to be held up. And so prophecy does that. 
It's not meant to direct people's lives, though there's, a, there's an insight that comes. So, so some people have that prophetic gift. Others have a teaching gift. Others have a leadership gift. Others have a mercy, uh, mercy gift. I mean, I think it's pretty clear that I've had a leadership gift on my life for a long time. And uh, um, my wife has a service gift and a mercy help gift. I don't know what those two gifts are. But Pastor Tim Lockins, he gets up at 7.30 on Sunday morning and he goes and helps set up the church before he leads and preaches. When I came to the Christian, I said, I'm not doing that. <laughs> Phil Bryce and Steve West, you guys do it. I don't care. You, you, the church, I'm, I'm, I'm ministering the word. I'm, I'm leading. I'm like, I had no compassion for them. <laughs> Terrible attitude. But I tell you, it took Steve probably three hours, getting up at 5.30 in the morning. He'd build a trailer. He had a team of 30 people. In fact, the, most, the second, be careful what I say, uh, the most, one of the most important roles in the church was the leader of the floor management team. I mean, like three hours before church, two hours after church, I would just rock up, preach and go home. <laughs> so I think that practical service area, Kathy loves that. Mercy helping. I come back from, from my overseas trips and I look for a shirt and it's gone. I say, sweetheart, where's that shirt? Where are the... It's awfully thin in there. Where, what happened to my shirt? She goes, I gave them away. You gave them away? <laughs> but they're my shirt. She goes, you haven't worn them in 15 years and you don't fit in them anymore. But I like to collect them. There's about 300 of them. <laughs> or paying for an old fella's who's dottering at the jolly food land, buying one tomato and one cabbage and working out his money, and, and she just says to the girl, I'll pay for it. And the guy nearly falls over and she says, oh, sir, this woman has paid for you. Me, if I'm there, I'm saying, could you get moving? <laughs> I wouldn't say it. I think I, I, I've got a message to prepare. I've got, I've got to come and, and bless these people here. Like, like, I'm not thinking about how can I pay for it. If somebody reminds me, oh, yeah, I better do it. It's like, you just, what is that? Is it because we're built differently? We're all built differently. And God respects the fact that we're built differently and he plonks gifts into us. And he gives us a unique personality type and usually our personality type and the spiritual gift flow together. He gives us unique life experiences. He gives us some natural abilities. And these all work together to shape us so that we can serve him within the life of his church. And each of us have life experiences. Some life experiences are shockers. When I compare, you know, Kath's story in The Me I Can Be, uh, the book where she shares honestly about the, the terrible beatings she got from a, a very sinful father. I can't even relate to that. And, and the, the destruction that wrought. And I, my thoughts of my dad and mum, I can talk about them very easily and just start crying because I just I only felt love and warmth and acceptance and they weren't perfect by any means, but I, I felt secure and safe. Now, there are some things that's difficult when you come from a highly functional family for you to really understand what it's like to come from a, a destructive, dysfunctional family. So she's, she can do that. I can relate now to people who have had cancer in their life. I didn't understand that before. I said to one of our ladies, I said, we're in a special club, aren't we? The I said, we know each other at a level that we just, no one really understands. Pastor Alan, myself, others who have gone through it or are going through it. Because your life experiences can help change you and prepare you to more effectively add value to another person's life. Your natural abilities, your spiritual gifts. So he lists these gifts here, amazing gifts. And so we have different gifts according to the grace given us. In other words, these are special gifts of grace, freely given by God to his people to meet the needs of the body. 
And he has equipped you with these spiritual gifts and natural abilities and a distinctive personality and various life experiences. He has uniquely shaped you for a ministry within his church, this church. You're not an accident. You're not an appendage. You're not saying, well, oh, I can't do anything. Of course you can. You say, oh, no, I'm not that. It's like the finger saying, well, that's not important. Well, you chop it off and see how important it is. You get some men and women have tinnitus in their ears and it affects their hearing. And it's a really serious condition. It, it can drive you crazy, actually. It, it, can, it, it can cause a, your ears, you take them for granted. But you get a blocked ear for a couple of days and all of a sudden you go, oh, I can't hear how it affects you. Every part of your body is important. And you know, if you are not functioning in body ministry in the church, you're robbing the church from being healthy, the church growing, because every part's important, the little toe, the little finger, the ear, the hair, the every part, all the and yet we're one. But when one part doesn't function properly, it affects everyone. So that's why if God has brought you here, if he's saved you by his grace, if he's placed his Holy Spirit within you, if he's given you community and you are the body, Paul says, then get functioning. Identify your gifts. Accept your unique personality. Identify those natural abilities you have. Assess your life experiences. There is a role for you in the body. So the body can be healthy. It can grow effectively. No more observer status. That's what he's saying. It's... it's participation, experience, get involved. It's no more consumer. Well, I'll just come and consume. No, 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 no. Now it's time to contribute and to be involved. And in that way, the body gets healthy. And I'll tell you what, when you start producing fruit, real fruit, where you say, man, this is really helping people. This is helping people. I'm seeing the effect. It then gives you a great sense of personal fulfillment. And when you're faithful in outworking those, those gifts and graces and you start to, to see fruit occur in people's lives, then you find great fulfillment, a sense of purpose. As I said last week, I have appreciated the power of music and the importance of music. If one thing I've, one thing I've learned out of many things is, you know what? I take music for granted. The creative genius of God where God is a happy God. He's a creative God. He's a God of color, a God of music, a God of... He's not a grumpy old man in the sky. He's a God of color and beauty and, and, and as well as order. And he's given us music and, and, uh, and, and the songs that we sing. They're so meaningful. You get the right words with the right tune, melody, hum, it's just beautiful. It just melts your heart. Now let me read Peter, what he says. Because I've got another great passage. I trust that passage in Romans 12 is, is helpful. Look at Peter. Sort of read and reflect a little bit on, on Peter's words. He says this. Uh, these, he goes, above all, he talks about community. Because if you're in a church, if you're in a, a relational connected group, it goes, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. And all the grumble bums said, don't like that verse. <laughs> Each of you should use whatever gift you've received for yourself. It's all about you. Become gift focused. It's about me, about I. It's about what I can do. No, no, no. It says these are all, whether your natural gifts, your spiritual gifts, these are all not about me, but about we. It's not about I, but it's about us. To serve others. When a person becomes gift manic, where they think it's all about them expressing their gift, it gives me the creeps. I'm like, wow, what's that about? It's about me. And they're all touchy-feely. Well, you know, you're not recognizing. I remember one guy saying to me, you know, I'm a healer. And you're not recognizing my healing ministry. Like he wanted to come up here and preach and he wanted to. 
And I, and, and, and I said, well, I said, you know, look, I guess uh, I can't make you a healer. I said, the only thing I can recommend is if you've got a, a gift of healing that flows, just find some sick people, place one hand there, one hand on the head and pray. See what happens. If everyone you pray for doesn't get better, I don't think you've got the gift of healing. You might comfort them. I said, but I said, D -d -d I can't give you this. I can't make you this. I said, if, if you, you know, because he's thinking it's all about him, if he can be up front. And, and in the early years, this is true, true story. We had a significant move of healing take place. And a couple of times, and I would come down and pray with a couple of times, I had our ministry prayer team and somebody saying, let's say it was, it was Cass or Phil or Kathy, um, I'm waiting for Pastor Bill. They didn't want them to pray for them. They wanted me as if I'm closer to Jesus than them. As if some, and like I'm thinking, and that scared the living daylights out of me. I thought, oh, wow. I thought, I don't like that. See, if you think of yourself more highly than you ought, or if you, you, you can get an ego, if that sin of pride comes in, the devil's got you. If it's all about you. So you know what I did? I withdrew and I became the orchestra conductor and the musicians were all down there and they would lay hands and pray and I did that for quite a long time just to break that thing to realise and then taught about body ministry. It's Jesus that heals through people and, and there might be some people who have a greater proficiency and are used in that area, but that's just because of experience and, and time. And so one has to be very careful here, extremely careful. It, it says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received, just go back to that, to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Let's go back to that scripture, guys. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength. Can we, can we get that, the Bible verses up there, please? Thanks, yep. If anyone speaks, they should do as, so as one who speaks the very words of God. Notice that? If you speak, make sure you, you speak God's words. It's not about you. If anyone serves, they should do it with the strength God provides. So that in all things God may be praised. Notice that the glory has got to be his. To him be glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. So I've just got a couple of dot points here. Therefore love each other deeply, he says, if we're a community. It's what makes us different and distinctive as Christ followers. This is what makes the Christian family center distinctive to any other social group. The church of Jesus Christ is to love as Jesus loved. And love covers failures. Love covers faults. Love covers frailties. The great Spurgeon said, you know, the Prince of Preachers he, in the 1800s, I love Spurgeon, he goes, you've got to have one blind eye and one deaf ear to, to stay sane in life. Because if you're always eagle-eyed and trying to find sin, you'll find it. You've got to have one blind eye and one deaf ear. I hear a lot of things. I go, whoop, didn't hear that. To walk on by. Oops, saw that. Nah, didn't see it. Blind yourself. Because sin abounds, but grace abounds even more. And, and so one must be mercy-oriented, forgiveness-focused, and looking for the, 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 the mercy of God, the love of God to flow. And I hate the way our society has become so unbelievably judgmental and hyper-self-righteous. And people are out there kind of pointing out people's sins and mistakes that occurred back 20, 30 years ago. Like the Prime Minister of Canada, uh, what's his name? Trudeau. Trudeau. He's not very bright and he's not a very good Prime Minister. He's, he's, a, he's a bit silly. But they, they reckon he's going to be tossed out because as a kid, he put on a black face. And he's repented of it. He said, I'm sorry, I was just a kid. I was 19, 20, I shouldn't have done it. But, you know, this is the worst sin in the world. Like I'm thinking, well, we're the quick to judge. And even if a person acknowledges their, their sin, and he said that, he's, a, he's repented about three times publicly, I've got to give it to him. But they reckon he's going to get turfed out because of, because of that. 
They reckon Jacinta Ardern's going to be turfed out next election, and she's a really fine, comes from a Christian background, uh, because of one mistake she's made, to do with a sexual harassment thing to do in her political party, that some guy was a creep and, and they didn't deal with him quickly enough. And I mean, she's the Prime Minister, she doesn't know everything. No, oh, she's responsible. So it's like, and the press are going, like, they're just like devils to try and attack a person. And, and there's, no, there's no forgiveness, no grace that's extended to people. And that's not to say where there's injustice and where there is evil, it should be dealt with. And uh, that's very important. And I've been dealing with a, a, a long-term situation where a young girl was abused in, in a church 20 or so years ago, not in one of our churches. And uh, she's now a grown woman, and she was 14, 15 when it started. And somebody in, in that church, who was a person in authority, not the pastor, started grooming her, and ultimately uh, it became a pretty bad situation. When it was found out, thankfully the pastor kicked that guy out of the church, they dealt with it, it was reported, all that stuff. But, uh, so, but I, my advice to her, when she came to me, is go to the authorities immediately. In fact, I said to her, I said, you know what, I said, I, I said you've told me this, I said, I'm just letting you know I'm going to ring the authorities tomorrow and report this guy. You realise I have to do that. I said, you know why? I said, because he still could be doing it with other children in another church somewhere. And thankfully, the police have charged him. It's become a matter. He'll probably end up in jail. And I thank God for that. It needs to occur. Justice needs to occur. At the same time, I've encouraged her, don't have retribution, don't have vengeance, and, and let it go. But it does not mean that Justice shouldn't occur because you've got to protect vulnerable kids. Um, so love covers failures, faults, sins. Love forgives again and again. Did you, did you read the story of um, the boy uh, who was tragically killed in, uh, in the USA? A guy named Botham James. Botham Jean. Botham Jean was a young Christian black man from, I think, the Caribbean. Beautiful guy involved in his church, and uh, so he's, he's actually in his own unit, and there's a young policewoman who's new on the job, she's got a weapon, she's got a uniform, she's coming home, she lives the floor below him. She's coming home and she's texting, and she's, you know, it's dark, and, and, and uh, she's texting and, and not focusing, so she parks her car, she presses the lift, she goes up and she misses her floor, goes to the next floor. As she goes out, she sees the door open. She thinks it's her house. Out comes the gun. Bang, 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 and shoots him dead. Wow. She should hear the mum and the, the, the dad and, and, um, and then the brother in court. The, the judge is an African-American woman who loves Jesus. Amazing. The judge. She just sentences her to 10 years jail. Not for malicious murder, but for carelessness and for in, just, just being totally irresponsible and not learning how to... And the 18-year-old brother... This, this, you've got to watch this. I've got, I've got a clip up here. You've got to watch the 18 That actually shares him before he gets out and hugs her, he says, I forgive you. And he says, you need Jesus in your life. It's wonderful. You can check it out on YouTube. You need Christ in your life. And he, he basically talks to her that you need Jesus. I have forgiven you. And he asks the judge, can I give you a, a hug? And the judge goes, yeah. And the judge is crying as he does that. And so the woman starts howling. I mean, like, it's really quite moving. And then the judge gets down from her bench goes into her thing and brings out a bible and puts her up puts her arm around the person she just sent us a 10 years jail and says honey you got to read this and she showed her john 3 16 and she's got all this criticism like everyone the, the atheists and everyone in america goes go jump in the lake she wasn't doing it as a judge she's justice but she's showing mercy but that boy 18 year old boy and the judge i mean it just it's just gone all over the world so it's about a 10 minute clip on YouTube, you ought to download it, but it's the power of forgiveness in that terrible situation where a beautiful young man gets 
senselessly killed because of her carelessness, her frailty. And, uh, you know, and what she was texting wasn't really healthy stuff. It all came out in court. I won't talk about it. It wasn't really healthy stuff to, to particular people, and she's just distracted. But she's a person with a uniform. She's got a weapon. She's not thinking the responsibility. That's why they, they, they put her in jail for 10 years. To say, no police officer, you've got a weapon, you've got a thing, you just be extremely careful in any situation. So, so it's the power of forgiveness um, of, of this guy. Love each other deeply. There's no sin that cannot be forgiven. It does not mean there shouldn't be justice that outworks itself. It goes hand in hand. Be hospitable to one another. That's the other thing he's saying in community. Let's make all our visitors really feel welcome when they attend a CFC service. You see someone that you haven't seen before? Go to say hello. Be friendly. Break out of your own friendship group. Don't ask a person how long you've been coming because they might have been coming for 12 months. <laughs> or three years. Just say, hi. I'm Karen Crouch. Good to see you. And just, just be friendly. You just, particularly if you recognise somebody who's new, who perhaps is on their own. One of the things that upsets me more than anything is if I see someone who's visiting and they're on their own and no one's talking to them. That's why we have coffee and meal and why Jan and Kathy and the teams handle the, the food. We don't make a profit out of that kitchen. In fact, the last figures were, were below budget. Don't know what's going on. We better lift the prices up. Anyway, but, you know, it's, like it's there for, for fellowship and for care and support and, and connecting people at a reasonably priced meal. So we want our church to be hospitable. Paul, Peter says, be hospitable to one another. <laughs> and notice this, without grumbling. Why does he put that in? Because it means you've got to get out of yourself. It's not about you. It's about the other person. And uh, let's all use our homes, make our homes havens of hospitality. Uh, Kath and I have a lovely house, and w when, we, when we started building it, I said to her, Sveta, this is the last one. They're going to carry me out of this one. I said, we're going to be here for a long time, so I don't mind just spending a little bit of money in it. So we've made it nice. But you know the thing we spent most of the money in is in the hospitality area. Not our area, but to be able to have, we could have 50, 60 people in there. And we've had up to 150 people outside with a swimming pool and, and inside. And our greatest joy is that we, that we use it for being a, a, a haven of hospitality for people. And we have a little unit, kind of an attached area that we call the resort. And we have people staying there. They've got their own little area and bathroom and separate. It's just great. I just couldn't think of just having my house for me. It's my castle. We're, we're to be hospitable. Use your homes. Those of you who are hosts of life groups, it's fantastic. Just make sure it's clean and go for it. <laughs> Open your home. You've got a suitable home and, and uh, you don't need to have a flashy place and and create room. If you've run out of chairs, sit on the floor. Let's, you know, let's make this a haven of hospitality and fellowship and have good coffee. Not caterers blend and international. Have good coffee and quality coffee and, and not yo-yo biscuits. Get something nicer. <laughs> hey, make your home a haven of hospitality. In a world that can be so, so self-centred. And, uh, and Peter makes this comment, community. And, and then use your gifts to serve others. The needs of other people will move you with Jesus' compassion and mercy to take action. You will. Gifts are, are not for us, but for others. And faithfully administer God's grace in its various forms. So be faithful to who you are and what you are uniquely called and gifted and shaped to do. Being used by God and producing good fruit causes great personal fulfilment. So I want to challenge you all, and more than challenge you, deeply encourage you 
to explore the opportunities there are to become a ministry participant. In this church, in this congregation, I've said the same to the 8.30 crew, I'll say the same tonight at 5.30, commit yourself to getting connected and making a contribution according to how you are wired and shaped, according to your gifts and natural abilities and personality type. Don't fear. We respect your personality, your unique personality type. If you're a deep introvert and, and you, you, you struggle to, to connect with people, we're not going to put you at the door to be the welcomer. Some people are much better behind a desk when people come to them. And you need your, inter, your, your, your extroverts who are just, you know, like... But you don't want fanatics either. You don't want people who are unbalanced. I went to a church, well, this is true, in the early, in the, in the early 70s. This is, this is called seeker hostile, instead of being seeker sensitive. So you're sitting there and the pastor gets up and he's full of love, you know, like, I just love Jesus and I love you. I'm a stranger, so he doesn't know me. Then he says, let's all stand up and we're going to sing the song, Yes, I love you with the love of the Lord. I want you to turn around and look into the person's eye and sing it to him. You imagine doing that? Yes, I love you with the love of the Lord. Yes, I, I can see you knew the glory of... I mean, I just thought this is... Talk about driving out visitors. Too much. Too much. I mean, some people may like that, but 99% of people don't like it. So I'm not talking about... You've got to have... The, the right approach, sensitive, sensible. So if you're a, a real introvert, don't worry. We're, we're going to respect you in that way. If you are a real extrovert, we'll tone you down. <laughs> and it's not about we have 30 or 100 roles in the church. So, okay, okay, Nikki, you're that, doing that. And uh, these Wobnitz boys, you can do that. No, no, we're saying, how has God made you? What is your gift? What's your natural ability? What's your personality type? What are your life experiences? You know what? There's a particular role. I think it might be called breakout. Yeah. Am I being prophetic or do I have knowledge about this? <laughs> you know, so, and this is important. All of us, if you are not connected in this way, or refuse to commit yourself, and you say, no, I'm just observer status. I've been doing it for three years, so I'm just consumer. I'm a consumerite for the last five years. You are robbing the church, and it's causing ill health. If God has placed you here, then he wants you to identify what, who you are in him, and our role as pastors and leaders is to help facilitate you into areas that will produce tremendous fruit. Be faithful in that, and it will cause great personal fulfillment and satisfaction. To help you do this, we have a response sheet that I'm going to ask the ushers right now to stand up and to quickly hand them out to every one of you. I've got a response sheet. I want you to, to look at this. This is our action point for today. Okay, ushers, run. Do it quickly, guys. Too slow. Get a few other helpers. I don't want this to be 15 minutes. I want it to be two minutes. Take one. And if you have a pencil, hold it in your right hand or left hand. If you don't have a pencil, then one of the ushers will bring one to you. I want to, to go over this with you. And I'm going to pray. This is really important. We do this maybe once every couple of years. Okay. Do we all have one? Good. I see the ushers are running. Good on you, guys. These old boys, they, they can run. Good on you, Brian, Pete. You're fantastic. Everyone have one. Okay. Okay. The front page is ministry areas serving across our church. The second page is specifically 
congregation based. In the box we've said here, we're committed to helping you find the most suitable ministry area according to your gifts and abilities. Creative ministries, kitchen, kids ministry, youth, IT, midweek office administration, people support, life groups, hires, facilities. You know we have 30,000 people using these facilities every year. And Max Lockett is volunteers pretty well full-time to do it, retired bank manager. And uh, I know many of you are used for ushers, and that's a paid thing, that part of the hires, ushers and stuff like that. But there are areas of, of uh, volunteerism that is, we need people who, are, who, got, who know how to smile, who know how to welcome, who know how to be hospitable, to welcome the people here on our property, kids and teachers and other community groups. Um, people support, life groups, hires. Our, we have uh, groups that go into the nursing homes and they sing, minister to them. I heard of a story today of somebody who was telling me that, that a, a man in his 80s who hasn't been able to go to church for about four months and his church, so I've heard, I think they've rung him twice in that four months. And I said, well, bring him here. We'll love on him. I said he should have a visit at least every week. If he can't come to church, we'll take church to him. We'll take communion to him. I just, I just don't understand that, how you can not care for the elderly who have been massive contributors and part of the life of the church who are not looked after and we, we have a fabulous team here of pastoral care and crisis care people, people particularly looking after people who can't be in a small group or a life group and it's, it's so important how we care for our children, how we care for our elderly is a sign of how spiritual we are, of how civilised we are, of how real we are, the most needy, the most vulnerable. So he, here's facilities, grounds. We've got a fantastic gardening team. It doesn't just happen like that. We have a group of men and women that love it. You may love doing practical gardening work. George Grab will grab you. <laughs> he says to me, oh, Bill, I'm getting a bit old. I think he's in his 80s, but he's fantastic. He doesn't look a day over 65. Good on you, George. You've got another 10 years in you yet. But he needs some help. Danny Huber and others. Now, over the page, ministry areas serving in the congregation, the 1030 congregation. Church, if you're not involved, I'm appealing to you to become a team member. Join the team. No longer an observer, no longer a consumer. You're a contributor, you're a participant according to how God's made you. We will help you. If, for example, you might put something in there like, you know, when I was experimenting with different ministries, one time I joined the choir. This is back in the Sturt Street days. The choir. And, and, and people said, what's Bill doing in the choir? He can't sing. What's he doing there? We can't sing in tune. And I'm evangelising, I'm doing a whole pile of spirit. I'm up there. And, and look, the only reason is there was a young girl named Kathy who was part of the choir. And I thought the best way to get close to her is to go and sing there with her. I put everyone else off. They didn't have the heart to kick me off. But if you want to become a singer and you can't sing, somebody will politely say to you, after much patience, maybe you might have that one wrong. So we have to be realistic. It's a bit like being at the door and, and you just can't handle being too extroverted and well, you've got to be built a certain way. So therefore, in all that you do here, of course there's assessment. With kids and youth ministry, of course there's government regulations, police checks, your, your, your worker's card, all that stuff has got to be protected and so even driving youth and, and kids home all that stuff is now regulated you can't just 
kind of, you know, if cars don't have seat belts or if there's, we, we, there's, there's huge regulation over us. So some things, there are some limitations. But guys, if you're not involved, become a team member. If you want to explore new areas, you are involved, but you want to explore some new areas, then why don't you put that down as well? If you have a pen, hold it there. I want you to write, because we're going to collect this in a few months. I want to pray for you. Father, thank you for the, the, the great privilege of being able to share this message, the importance of seeing that we're made for community. We're made in your image and we're made for community. And we are much better together than being isolated on our own. And I pray, help my brothers and sisters, Lord, all those that you have called to be part of this church. And for those who are new, who are still reflecting on whether this is to be their spiritual home, I pray that this will be a tipping point for them, that they, a point of decision. Help us, Lord. Help people to make a commitment today to get connected into the life of the church and to make a contribution in ministry that will give them great personal fulfillment and produce terrific fruit. And we pray that we will be faithful, as Peter says, in this area. Touch every person and may there be, out of this message and action that we take today, the church become healthier. This 1030 congregation becoming healthier and growing and full of life. Our 8.30 congregation, our, our Friday 11 a.m., our 5.30 tonight, I pray, grow your church in a healthy way. Let every member function to become a united body, a healthy, functioning, fruitful, fulfilling body. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you fill this in? And if you need a little bit more time and you want to bring it back next week, that's okay. But if you have filled this in and said, look, this is an area, we will make contact with you. If you can hand this to an usher, so the ushers, you guys be ready to receive these. So, so either take it or hand it in. Uh, we would love to, to see some terrific outcomes occur. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Cass.